Um, and today we are beginning a series on spiritual self-care. And self-care is quite a buzzword right now. You know, it's the idea of disengaging some of the things that clamor for our attention in order to give attention to our neglected parts, to our neglected selves. And the idea is to replenish and then be able to take care of our responsibilities in our lives with more joy and peace. So often self-care is associated with things like a hot bath or a massage or getting your nails done. But over the course of this series, we're going to be talking about spiritual self-care. Now, a lot of us have in our minds an image of the woman we want to be. And I often find myself wanting to be a certain person. I mean, well, like Jesus, of course, but you know, this woman that I have in my mind, this takes good care of her soul woman, you know, the woman with noble character. She is calm and spiritually minded. She holds her tongue. She is secure. She gives to others without expecting anything in return. Her heart is soft and pure. And I can imagine being her, but I often find that I lack the program, so to speak, to become her. It's like I don't know how sometimes to get from me, who is often not those things, to her, the person that I really want to be. But there are actually well-worn paths of spiritual development that Christ taught and practiced because they serve to keep him close to the Father. And many of them are disciplines that were actually handed down even to Jesus, things from the ancient days that were tried and true. And a lot of them we don't talk about a lot today. Jeremiah 6.16 says, this is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. So today we're going to be able to ask for the ancient paths and learn to walk with them. Keep in mind that the things we're going to talk about over the course of this study are the things you're going to have to practice. And in doing so, you will develop some spiritual muscles that will aid in your spiritual walk and prepare you for difficult times and difficult days. So this is not going to be merely an intellectual exercise. In fact, some of the things that have so badly damaged Christianity is the ever popular idea that we can somehow be like Jesus just by talking about Jesus. But it's really the more difficult part is really beginning to live like Jesus lived and engage the day-to-day -day practices that kept him spiritually strong. And that's what we're going to be talking about throughout this study. Most of these things are not easy. Some of them are uncomfortable and all of them require discipline. Some spiritual disciplines we talk about quite a bit in the church, like Bible study and prayer, but there's others that we don't give much lip service to, like secrecy or stewardship. And so we're going to be focusing during the course of these six weeks on ones that we feel like don't get enough attention or ones where we've learned some things that maybe will open our minds to thinking about some of those disciplines differently. Dallas Willier, there's a book that I love. I have read it years ago. Those in Lexington remember when I was really into this book. Um, it's called The Spirit of the Disciplines by Dallas Williard. And he divides the spiritual disciplines into a, a, the disciplines of abstinence and the disciplines of engagement. And it's a really great way to think about it. If I do the things that require my self-denial, for instance, abstinence of some kind, then I get accustomed to not always being comfortable. And therefore, I'm less prone to temptation at times when I find myself uncomfortable, or I'm less prone to bitterness when I'm being denied something I want because I'm accustomed to discomfort. If I do things that require my engagement, then I'm less prone to that self-absorbed sedentary life that can get a hold of us and that infects so many of our hearts. So these disciplines, the disciplines of abstinence and engagement, guard our hearts against both the sense of commission and the sense of omission. Now today we're going to talk about silence and solitude, which are clearly disciplines of abstinence, right? And then we're going to move on to the abstaining disciplines of secrecy, of fasting, and then followed by engaging disciplines of worship, service, and stewardship. So this is not an exhaustive list. If you Google the spiritual self, the spiritual disciplines, you're going to find all kinds of lists. A lot of them will have certain disciplines in common, and then they'll vary in a few of the disciplines. But my hope is that by learning about some of these ancient disciplines, you will add them to the spiritual rhythms of your life and grow in your faithfulness to God. So what do the scriptures say about taking care of your soul? Not surprisingly, the scriptures say, 
quite a lot. <laughs> and in fact, the whole Bible is pretty much about how to take care of your soul, right? So, but they speak a lot to what solitude and silence can do for the soul as well. There is, first of all, just this general idea of silence and calmness in the Bible as a part of spiritual maturity. Scriptures like Habakkuk 2.20 talk about how silence before God is an appropriate response to his majesty. It says, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Isaiah 30.15 says, in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. One of the things that I often talk to young women leaders about is that idea of being the calming force in the room, that it radiates out of your inner silence and strength. And some women exude this naturally, like, thank you, Trisha Shanks. A lot of you know her in Columbus. She just is naturally just a calming force in your life. But many of us, most of us, myself included, have to practice some spiritual disciplines in order to capture this stillness that the Bible talks about. So many of the times in the Old Testament, the great people of faith in the Bible, they met God in quiet, solitary places. Think of Moses and the burning bush, or Elijah when he runs from Jezebel and hides under the broom tree. David, he wrote so many psalms while alone tending sheep, including the ever-famous Psalm 23, which talks about the restorative power of silence and solitude when he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Jeremiah even talked about sitting in silence when you're under the discipline of God. In Lamentations 3, verses 27 and 28, he says, it is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. Let him sit alone in silence for the Lord has laid it on him. That even when we're on the, under the discipline of God, sometimes we need to sit in silence and take it in so that the lessons can get deep in our soul and we're not distracted by other things. We all know that Jesus began his ministry by spending 40 days alone in the quiet wilderness and fasting. So three of the spiritual disciplines. But it wasn't just to start his ministry. It wasn't just those 40 days. Jesus actually made solitude a part of his regular life. In Mark 1.35, you see very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Luke 5.16, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Luke 6, 12, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Jesus often retreated to quiet, solitary places to be with God. And it is clear from the scriptures that there's just something to the silence and solitude thing. And it's very clear from the scriptures that Jesus made it a regular practice of his to seek out those times. It is in those quiet, solitary places that Jesus grew in his strength and his relationship with God. You know, often I can be looking to be like Jesus without doing the things that Jesus did to build that strength of character. I mean, I don't want to get up early and I don't want to be alone with my thoughts, to be perfectly honest. And I definitely don't want to be alone in the wilderness in the dark of morning. And yet that's exactly what Jesus did. He didn't have a cell phone crazy, right? <laughs> but he also wouldn't have been able to bring his Bible or his journal because those were not portable things back then. He would have had no playlist, no podcast, nothing to jam to. He was just alone in a solitary place without distraction. Our modern society leaves us very little time alone and almost no time without noise. Many of us like to joke that our best thinking, well, many of the moms, I'm not sure if the young ladies uh, joke about this, but our best thinking comes in the shower or on the toilet. <laughs> and how could that possibly be? But if you're a mom, you know, that's the only time you're alone in silence. And sometimes not even then, <laughs> but it's alone where we can have full thoughts, 
You can let them go to completion without interruption. It's alone where you can dream dreams and let the Holy Spirit stir something within you. But we have all become so uncomfortable in our own thoughts that we pull out our phones at traffic lights and we turn on our TVs just to eat a bowl of cereal, or at least I do. <laughs> we can't stand the silence and we're afraid of our own voices. So there's words, opinions, the judgments of man constantly flooding our minds. So much so that it can be difficult to, for me to even discern what I really think about something or how I feel about it or what my convictions and beliefs really are. Even when it comes to absorbing spiritual knowledge, I am often on to the next bit of learning before the last bit has taken root deep into my heart and long before it has led to any actual change in the way I live my life. But take note of this, we will not gain the character of Jesus without living out the practices of Jesus. And Jesus often withdrew to lonely places. So what is it about lonely places? Why silence? Well, when you're alone, there are no distractions from your own inner life. There is a life that goes on inside our heads. And sometimes that life, that dialogue is totally separate from what's happening around us, right? Like, have you ever had a smile on your face when inside you were fuming or angry? But we can't really feel whole. We can't really have the in integrity of our persons if our inner life and our outer life don't match. And so we need to go and be alone with that part of ourselves. I can remember as a young Christian deciding to spend some time in solitude when I went on a research trip. I was working for the CDC and I needed to travel to a rural clinic for two to three days to gather some data. The clinic was in the mountains of North Carolina and I thought, well, this is gonna be a perfect time to retreat with God, right? So I booked a room at a bed and breakfast that had no TV and no internet. Now this was the time before smartphones. So that meant I was gonna be completely cut off from most people. And I was so excited to go. I knew that this was gonna be life-changing for me. But ladies, let me tell you, it was hard. It was so hard, much harder than I ever thought it would be. And I wasn't even totally alone. I mean, I was out of bed and breakfast, so there were owners there if I really got desperate. And I spent my daytime in a clinic, kind of locked away by myself, collecting data, but I still had people somewhat around me I could interact with if I was desperate. But mostly, I was alone. And it was a beautiful place and I spent tons of time with God, but I can remember, I think it was around the middle of the second day, sitting on a tree swing and just finally starting to cry. I didn't know what to do with myself. Though in my normal life, I was constantly craving time away from others out there where, it was, where I was really alone and it was really quiet. I felt so left out. I just felt alone but it was there that I could begin to deal with myself. I dealt with the mourning over the loss of a relationship that had broken up at the beginning of that year. I dealt with my fears and hesitations over the new boy named Sean that I had just met. And I met God there on that mountain. And I also found a bit of myself there. I heard my own voice for the first time in a really long time. And all of those inner conflicts that the busyness of life likes to keep under wraps, they surface in our times of silence and solitude so they can be purified. But this is not gonna be easy. We don't take the time to do it for a reason because it's hard. Dallas Williard says in this book that I just showed you that we can only survive solitude if we cling to Christ there. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna share my screen with you for a minute and show you another quote from a book called The Way of the Heart by Henry Nguyen that I really love. Share my screen. I wanna show it to you because it's a long quote. I want you to be able to read it along with me. But it says, in solitude, this is what I felt like that first time I tried to do this. This describes my feelings so perfectly well. In solitude, I get rid of my scaffolding. No friends to talk with, no telephone calls to make, no meetings to attend, no music to entertain, no books to distract, just me. Naked, vulnerable, weak, sinful, deprived, 
broken. Nothing. It is this nothingness that I have to face in my solitude. A nothingness so dreadful that everything in me wants to run to my friends, my work, and my distractions so that I can forget my nothingness and make myself believe that I am worth something. But that is not all. As soon as I decide to stay in my solitude, confusing ideas, disturbing images, wild fantasies, and weird associations jump about in my mind like monkeys on a banana tree. Anger and greed begin to show their ugly faces. I give long, hostile speeches to my enemies. <laughs> I actually have done that. And dream lustful dreams in which I am wealthy, influential, and very attractive, or sometimes poor, ugly, and in need of immediate consolation. Thus, I try again to run from the dark abyss of my nothingness and restore my false self in all its vainglory. The wisdom of the desert is that the confrontation with our own frightening nothingness forces us to surrender ourselves totally and unconditionally to the Lord Jesus Christ. That quote so perfectly describes for me what it's like when you first start to practice the discipline of silence and solitude. I really can't describe it better than that. It forces us to face our nothingness. It's humbling. It is humbling to see the world going on without us. It's humbling to have all the things that make us feel important removed. And if you go out in nature to enter into your solitude and silence, the vastness of it, the dangers in it, they are all just so humbling. And humility brings peace. Because pride is always striving, right? There is a calmness that results from no longer feeling the need to be someone, to accomplish something, or to prove anything. And that is what silence and solitude can bring you. A blog I read describes the practice of silence and solitude as similar to recovery days after a workout. It's actually during the recovery days that the new muscle is built and you grow in your strength. And similarly, being in day-to-day -day life with all its stressors and interactions and temptations, it's a spiritual workout. And it is during your times of silence and solitude that the recovery happens, that the real spiritual strengthening occurs. So how do we weave the practice of silence and solitude into our lives? First of all, realize that it's important and put it into your schedule. If you don't pick a date, you won't do it. Secondly, realize that silence and solitude is not the same thing as being alone. And introverts, I'm talking to you. Many of you like to be alone. But if you're alone and busy, or alone and occupied, or alone and completing tasks, this is not the same thing as the spiritual discipline of silence and solitude. Number three, start small and work your way up. You could start with something like being totally quiet while waiting alone in the car pickup line for your kids. No phone, no radio, just get comfortable with yourself a bit, comfortable with the quiet. You could try getting up early while it's still dark like Jesus did and the house is quiet. Sit on your porch or in your favorite chair and either before you read or after you read, set a timer for about five minutes and sit in silence as you just ponder your God. You could go for runs or walks with no music or podcast and just let your thoughts run a bit and talk to God. You could set a date with God if you are really getting froggy. Set aside three or four hours and go and have a date with God. Go somewhere alone and quiet. Make a good plan. If you're going to go on a three or four hour date, you need to maybe have some food or drink. You need to have an accessible bathroom, maybe a jacket if it's a little chilly. Plan out what you're going to study in your Bible and how much time you're going to send, spend in silence and what you really want to tackle in your soul in your time alone with God. You can journal read, pray, and come back refreshed. You know, dates with God used to be a thing in the church. Um, when I was in campus ministry, it was a thing, a good thing. Everyone did them. And it was a part of our spiritual practice. And I would so love to see this become a thing again. 
I used to go to Duke Gardens for many of my dates with God, and I just loved it. I felt so at peace, so refreshed. And I can remember there were all these ducks in the duck pond there, and I would love watching them and noticing all of their iridescence of their feathers and their detail and their bands of color. And I just felt so inspired by how creative God is. And I can remember thinking I was feeling so inspired that I thought, even though I'm actually a scientist, I thought that maybe I was also an artist. And so I went and bought a sketchbook. This is a true story. I bought a sketchbook and I really believed, I was so inspired in my times with God there that I really believed with all my heart that I was going to be able to draw these ducks as realistic as if you were looking at them live. I mean, I thought that that inspiration was just going to flow through my fingertips. But instead, my duck looked a lot like a blob with a beak. <laughs> and I got to laughing so hard out loud by myself in the middle of this park. Um, but I got to laughing so hard out loud. I knew that God was as tickled as I was by my utter lack of artistic ability. And I just really enjoyed God that day. I had fun with God on my date. So number three, start small, work up. Number four, go somewhere you love. Go to a local park or a nearby pond in your neighborhood. If it's cold or hot and you don't like the outdoors, honestly, rent some place for the night. Go to a friend's house with a nice view while they're away. There are so many places that I can go, but there is one place that never works well for me, and that's at home. It is simply too easy for my thoughts at home to be task-oriented, and it's so difficult for me to get anywhere deep with my soul when the laundry needs to be done. So maybe at home can work for you if you have a place that works really well, but I am way too distracted at home. Number five, set a timer on your phone and then turn it on Do Not Disturb. The phone can be such a distraction, but you're usually going to want it with you if you're out in the wilderness. So I'm not saying you have to leave it at home, but definitely turn it on Do Not Disturb. And setting the timer allows you not to feel the need to check for the time all the time and then get distracted by a text or something that might come up. Number six, practicing solitude without silence is also beneficial, such as having a great quiet time while listening to worship music. But the silence part is more rare and thus often more needed. So don't shortchange yourself. Seek them both. Number seven, don't give up just because it's hard. Don't give up when your mind wanders. Push past that frustration as you let your thoughts flow and recognize them because you're normally distracting yourself from your own thoughts. Silence and solitude can help you to be more comfortable with your own thought life and make you able to be more quiet in the presence of others because you gain the skill of being okay sitting in your thoughts. That stops bothering you to just let them go. You know that feeling you can get when you feel like you just have to say something when you're sitting there silently with a friend or the feeling you get when you want to jump in as someone sharing on a conversation with maybe solutions or fixes because all those solutions are flooding your brain? When you spend time in silence and solitude on a regular basis, you get used to not verbalizing every thought that you become aware of. You learn to listen and to let some of your thoughts go. You get secure enough to be quiet. Remember Isaiah 30, 15 says, in quietness and trust is your strength. So I really hope that I have convinced you that it needs to be a part of your regular rhythms of your spiritual life and that you will start implementing this into your practice with God. So what we're going to do now is we're going to break up into some random breakout grooms, rooms to discuss the spiritual disciplines. It is not lost on me that I've just talked about silence and we're going to break up and talk, but I thought that sitting in silence in a breakout room over Zoom might be a little weird, so we are going to discuss, <laughs> but I have a few questions to help you out. When you get into your rooms, you aren't going to, there's no leader set up for each breakout room, so just introduce yourself to the ladies in your breakout room. There'll be about three or four of them, and then jump in on the questions. So the questions I have for you, hopefully someone will type them in the chat there. Number one, have you ever practiced silence and solitude? If so, what was that like for you? What did you learn by doing it? And if not, how do you feel about the idea of practicing silence and solitude? So again, have you ever practiced silence and solitude? If so, describe that. What was it like? What did you learn? And if not, how do you feel about it? Number two, what is one way you can begin this week to implement silence and solitude into the spiritual rhythms of your life? What is one way you can begin this week to implement silence and solitude into the spiritual rhythms of your life? 
And number three, what would you do, where would you go if you went on a date with God? What would you do and where would you go if you went on a date with God?